board meetings. Hopefully they're taking a snack and coming back. Okay. Thank you for attending this event, either live or in person. Tonight is my pleasure to open up this presentation. One that will provide information concerning where we are as a borough and as a school district and where we plan to be over the course of the next two years. We're here this evening to present information that outlines how we have best come to the point of determining that a proposed Doyle School expansion would be the best alternative in addressing the needs of our growing community. Myself, as the superintendent of schools, Mr. Sarlo is our mayor, Mr. Iowa is our borough administrator, and Mr. Nieves is our board president, will all be sharing information this evening. It will most likely be a great deal of information to absorb, and I'm sure that we will follow up this presentation with posted documents and the live stream recording of this event on our school district website. Personally, for over 30 years, as a coach or a teacher, I've had the privilege of working in this community. I truly believe that during this time, it has been quite easy to observe the growth that is taking place in our town and in our schools. If anyone left town in 1992 and returned for the first time today, they would be astonished at the changes that have taken place residentially, commercially, educationally, and in the recreation programs that we offer to the youth of our community. For those of you who remember, in 1997, I was hired as a part-time physical education teacher in our district. My assignment was to teach three classes a day each morning of physical education to the K-4 students at the Doyle School. Three classes a day, because that pretty much was the composition of the Doyle School at that time. There were roughly three sections of classrooms of grades K-4. to As a coach in the high school, I can recall a time, Mr. Caputo can re recall the same time, when the possibility of closing our high school and regionalizing with the neighboring community was very close to taking place. It was at that time we might have had fewer than 200 students in grades 9 through 12 of our high school. In the late 90s and the early part of 2000s, after declaring that the high school would remain open, in response to that commitment, we began to see our high school classes grow. As a result of this growth, the fifth grade was moved out of the former grade 5 through 8 Ostrovsky Middle School and housed instead in the Doyle School where I was a teacher. At the very same time, the district began to experience growth in our elementary levels. Good news, my job as a teacher became full-time as I now had classes to teach in the afternoon because of the growth at Doyle School. Moving to the year 2009, I had the wonderful opportunity to begin a tenure as the principal of the grades K-5 to Doyle School. I specifically can remember adding a fourth kindergarten class during that school year, which was quite a big deal at that time. That might have been the first grade level with fourth sections. We housed over 500 students in grades K to five and began to see continued growth in all grade levels. We had classrooms with over 30 students in them. Did not have a home for our preschool disabled students. And in the course of that time, we did actually unfortunately fail a public referendum for expansion. The borough and the board of education were in constant communication regarding the growth in the student population the subsequent growth in diverse student populations and their needs, and the need to both upgrade and expand existing facilities. You'll be reminded tonight in the presentation when the Woodridge Intermediate School did not exist. The Assumption School in town had closed, and the borough seized upon the opportunity to immediately address our needs at that time by purchasing the school building, overseeing the extensive renovations, and handing it to the Board of Education. While the intermediate school might be smaller in size in comparison to this building and the Doyle School, I could not fathom where we would be without that facility today. The opening of the intermediate school pulled grades four and five out of Doyle, about 200 students, and grade six out of the Ostrovsky School. That immediately provided some space at Doyle School as it converted to an early elementary school building. The high school became a junior senior high school holding grades seven through 12. The newly created space at Doyle initially served to help place smaller learning groups into larger classrooms. The district leased classroom space to the South Bergen Joint Commission as a source of revenue to help meet the financial needs of a growing district working under a 2% budget cap. Over time, the lease space was reclaimed to open our first preschool disabled classroom, our first inclusive pre-K classroom. 
We were now offering opportunities for our youngest learners to start in our school district and stay in our school district if that placement was deemed appropriate. We expanded our preschool classrooms both for disabled populations as well as for general education students. Our schools were growing because the town was growing and we were able to meet the needs of more students as opposed to placing them out of district. In 1997, there was no opportunity to offer these types of programs, whereas today we have the programs in place and now are talking about adding space and growing more programs in the facilities that will help us to continue meet the needs of all learners. We all know why we're here today and we all know how we got here. As a superintendent, uh, if, if my God lets me, I will be here and see this all the way through to completion because I've been fortunate to see the growth in our district sitting in this room or standing in this room right now and presenting and knowing what it used to be like and what my sound would sound like. This is, this is indicative of the commitment between the board and the town. And I think we do it right in terms of re renovating and rehabilitating our facilities. I cannot wait to see what that next building is going to be or the next expansion of the building is going to be. Now, in the presentation tonight, you're going to hear a great deal about what brought us here and a lot of business uh, discussion and taxes, et cetera. Um, that's part of my job, but my job really is putting programs into the school and making sure that they're staffed and supplied appropriately. So at one point in this timeline moving forward from tonight, you'll hear discussions and word and information will go out about what, what's going to be built and what's going to be where. That's when it gets into my hands with my administration, my staff, my parents, my students to decide what's going to be there. It's wonderful to know that you're going to get all of the space. Next, the next problem, which is a good problem, is to figure out what you can do there. Anybody who's been in Doyle School for the past 10 years knows when we had a need, we would try our very best to meet that need, and we became creative. When I started teaching, or in the middle of my teaching career, we built our new wing, which was a library wing. The library's gone now. The art room is gone now. We've cut classrooms into classrooms, because at that time, that was our only alternative. This promises to be something very important for the district and for our students, most importantly. Being a board member in another district in Bergen County, they're talking now about windows and air conditioning and changing the lights and rehabilitating the gymnasiums and the bleachers and the locker rooms. We are past that now. We are ready to go and grow and make meaningful impacts on the lives of our children and in the community. Of course, throughout the process, from an educational perspective. If you ever have a question or a concern, you can absolutely reach out to me at any time. This is the time of life for us as a district where I have to hear many opinions. Because if you've ever seen my home, any decision about painting walls and what colors and where stuff is going to go is not up to me. It's up to other people in my home. I'm going to be reliant upon all of you in our, in our community to determine what's going to be in that new building. And anybody who knows me relatively well, even though I wear hearing aids, I listen very well. And I listen to all opinions. I'm going to turn our program over to right now to our mayor, state senator, Paul Sarlo, who's going to then turn over to Mr. Eilert and ultimately to Mr. Nieves. Mr. Sarlo. Uh, good evening, everybody. First of all, uh, good evening to all you who are here this evening, and good evening to those who are joining us virtually uh, and online. This is uh, Woodridge Mayor uh, Paul Charlotte. On behalf of the governing body, who I'd like to introduce, uh, we want to thank the Woodridge Board of Education for allowing us to come in this evening um, and make a presentation on the partnership between the Mayor and Council and the Board of Education and the redevelopment process. Before I go any forward, I just want to introduce our council, Council President Dominic Gazzolini, Councilman Ezio Altamira, Councilman Philip Romero, Councilwoman Michelle Mabel, Councilman Ed Marino, and Councilman <coughs> Michael Donato, in no particular order. And our borough manager, uh, Chris Eiler. Um, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, Chris and I are going to be coming back and forth, uh, kind of sharing the podium here and, and sharing the presentation. Um, a little history uh, for those who don't know me. I was born and raised in Woodridge. Um, my sister 
in the late 60s attended Doyle School. My older brother attended Doyle School. I attended Doyle School. My younger brother attended Doyle School. My two boys attended Doyle School. Doyle School is really very important to my family. Um, it's very important to a lot of families who have come through this community. It, it really is an institution uh, that we could all be proud of. And by the end of this evening, when you walk out of here, I think you're going to even of what we could accomplish together. This partnership that you're seeing here between a mayor and council and a board of education does not happen often in the state of New Jersey. As you all know, I chair the Senate Budget Appropriations Committee for the last 14 years, and I have the opportunity to travel around the state, meeting with a lot of different folks on financing, uh, and especially some serious districts like Tom's River District and some other districts on financial e issues. I will tell you this, you go to a meeting, they don't allow the mayor and council for meetings in the mayor into their meetings. Um, so what is happening here and what has happened over the past uh, 20 years is just quite amazing. It really is a tribute to all of you as a community because you have embraced it and you have allowed us all to work together. So before I go further, I'm going to have our borough manager, Chris Isler, come up uh, and he's going to just talk a little bit about contractually and under law, the obligations of the mayor and council and a board of education during a school construction process. Thank you, Mayor. Everybody can hear me back there? I've never used one of these before, so just bear with me. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point. I know we're all here to see a brand new school uh, expansion, and we're all very excited about that. Steve, am I good? OK. Um, but we do want to just point out a, a few things. We One thing we've learned about this process is that there's a lot of people who uh, have moved into town more recently in the last three years, five years, 10 years and who are not really familiar with how school districts and towns operate in New Jersey. Um, it's different in New Jersey than it is in other states. And so we just want to give this quick one or two minute tutorial, just cutting to the here, is that in New Jersey, there's two types of school districts. Type one school districts are basically mayoral control. And the school district basically runs as if it was a department of the town government. Um, in a type two school district, which Woodridge is, it's an autonomous government entity. And the school board is elected by the voters. And the voters also have an opportunity to vote on the school budget unless the school board keeps the budget within the state mandated cap. And any sort of capital improvements undertaken by a school board have to be put out to the voters for referendum. Um, we keep hearing, and we've talked, I heard earlier at the, uh, the meeting before this about the cap laws. Um, there's cap laws for both school districts and there's cap laws for town governments. Uh, the school district cap law is based on what the school district's enrollment is. So their budget can't go up uh, over a certain percentage based on its enrollment. Uh, the town budgets are capped based on the rateables. Can't go over a certain percentage based on the rateables and the new development that's produced. Um, the town government is allowed to do borrowing and bonding on its own without going to the voters for approval. Uh, very, very important concept that's come along and are in, really into vogue in the last 10 years that's been promoted by state government is the idea of shared services. And the use of shared services is really how Woodridge functions. Um, a lot of other towns are now catching on, but we're really at the forefront of it. Um, just some very quick basic examples, the fact that the town tonight can plow the snow for the school district in the parking lots and in the spring cut the lawns. By the same token, in the summer, the town can use all the school facilities for summer recreation programs. Uh, those are sort of some of the examples of shared services that the law allows. What the law doesn't allow, though, is for a town government to directly give money to a school district and say, here's half a million dollars, here's a million dollars for your budget. Everything I just said to you, though, has a major, major exception, and that is if you're a redevelopment agency. And as the mayor is going to explain, because the borough mayor and council is a redevelopment agency for the Curtis Wright redevelopment, it gives the local town government the authority in partnership with the school board. You can't come in as a bully. The school board has to accept the assistance. But it gives the local town government the authority and the uh, legal authority, I should say, to participate in school construction projects and to help with school funding. So I'm going to turn it back to the mayor for a little bit of a history 
on how we became a redevelopment agency. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to try not to bore you with a little bit of a history lesson here, but I think it's important for all of you to understand how Westmont Station came, came to be and why it came to be and why it was an integral part of, the, of our community and why the value of our homes are where they are at today. Um, Curtis Wright property was a, the original owner in 1920s was Standard Oil, which is now Exxon. Um, they had a bunch of tank farms there. Uh, where they stored refined oil and gas completely and polluted the property. In the 1940s, the Curtis Wright Aeronautics Company took over the site in 1940s to 1970s. They inherited a building that was built by then the U.S. War Department. The U.S. War Department would now be your Department of Defense. Um, and they built engines for military bomber airplanes. They produced them through World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam War. In its heyday, it was 5,000 employees over three shifts that used to come down either Terhun Ave or Pasek Ave or Highland Ave. Highland Ave was a traffic jam all the way out to 17 uh, at the end of each shift, right through the night. They operated in an 8-acre landfill, and unfortunately, between the landfill and all the congestion, and all the work that was going on down there, building these airplane <coughs> bomber airplane engines, uh, the site became very polluted. <coughs> you all have seen that sign, that legacy sign. What occurred is when they got out of the manufacturing business, they had this vast piece of land that they needed to, to, to keep going. So Curtis Wright then stopped manufacturing in Woodridge in the late 70s. And they went into the warehousing business, light industrial, not the warehousing business that you think of today, the Amazons of the world and the Prologis of the world. And what they decided to do was file repeated tax appeals. And for some of you who've been here and been around for a long time, you know what those tax appeals were like. They went on from the 70s to the 90s. And unfortunately, New Jersey tax courts kept ruling in the favor of Curtis Wright. Quite frankly, Woodrow's got their butts kicked. <clears throat> over 20 million in tax refunds over a 25 year period were paid back from the Woodrow's taxpayers back to Curtis Wright Corporation. Our annual budget was six to seven million dollars back in the late 90s. <clears throat> Woodrow's tax base was 250 to 300 million dollars uh, in total. Here's the, here's the one that put us over the edge. The final New Jersey tax court ruling. They came in and told us, a judge ruled that the property was worth $19 million. They took $50 million out of that $250 million tax base and wiped it right out of our community. <clears throat> I was elected to mayor and ran in 1999. I was sworn in January 1 of 2000. And I'll tell you the truth, I was scared, quite frankly. Um, I don't know how I got through what we did back in 1999 and 2000, because quite frankly, um, it was kind of new to me. Politics wasn't really in my blood or my family. Uh, engineering and, and land use and construction was what I was trained to do. Um, but I was faced with this tax court ruling of $19 million. And we had to pay back $8 million to Curtis Wright. That was the $8 million of the $20 million uh, that we were talking about. So we already paid them 12. Uh, I went down to uh, Trenton uh, and I petitioned the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs and I requested permission to issue an $8 million bond payable over 15 years. I was told at that meeting by a bunch of folks there at that meeting, <clears throat> and I remember the one man in particular said to me, son, mayor, um, don't keep coming back here. You better figure it out. Uh, that's a vast piece of land, got some environmental issues, but you better figure it out. And what we did, we did figure it out. We decided <clears throat> to take advantage of the New Jersey Redevelopment and Housing Law and redevelop the Curtis Wright property to create new rateables. <clears throat> we took some very significant actions in 2000 and 2002. We convened lawyers, planners, financial advisors, and experts in New, New Jersey Redevelopment Law. 
We conducted a redevelopment study and we declared the Curtis Wright property to be blighted. Um, this is when redevelopment back in 2000 was just about to begin. Uh, declaring a property blighted was a pretty risky, strong, bold measure because you were about to come in and try to take somebody's property. We de designated the entire track, an area in need of redevelopment. We condemned the property. We forced them to auction the property. Not knowing where we would end up, but we ended up in a pretty good place. And in 2002, Somerset Development bought the property for $50 million, basically reversing what the judge had told us, that the property was worth $19 million. We increased the property value on that sale from 50 million, from 19 million to 50 million. We began drafting the redevelopment plan. I'm gonna have Chris come up and walk you through some of the goals of that redevelopment plan. But when we sat with, some of you who were even in this room who were, who were part of that process in some of the meetings. And we, this redevelopment, we got one chance to get this right for the future of this borough. And if we're gonna go forward this, we need to make an investment in our education, our recreation, and our infrastructure. And if we could do all three of them successfully, we will increase the value of the homes of Woodridge. We will become one of the most desirable little communities in North Jersey. Really good job over the investments in all three of them. But the missing piece is the Doyle School expansion. And that's why we're here tonight. So I'm gonna have Chris walk you through uh, where we were at prior to the redevelopment and, and, and where we are today. Uh, as the mayor alluded to, the redevelopment plan was informed by the needs of the community. And we had citizen groups and citizen committees. Um, there's some people that are in the room today who are part of that, not just some of our elected officials, but I, I'm looking at a few of the gentlemen who have gray hair out there and they were on the committees with the mayor and, and some of us were involved with the early days. Um, Mr. Albro did a really good job of explaining where the district was years ago at that time, so I'm not going to go through point by point. But the quick version of it is, is that 10 years ago, we only had two schools in the entire district. The entire school district population was served by this building, uh, which was built in 1922, and the Doyle School, which was built in 1952. Um, there were some additions over the year over the years, but at the end of the day, we were servicing the entire town with two buildings. Um, at the time, prior to the redevelopment plan, Doyle School had five less rooms than it does today, and yet it had about the same number of kids as it does today, around 400, 450. And this building had over 600 students in it. And I think most significantly, which you know, when you hear about it in today's context, it really raises some eyebrows, but back then, this building had fifth and sixth graders in it with the high school grades. Um, the mayor always likes to point out uh, about our athletic facilities at the time because he and his brothers were, were athletes here in the high school. Um, the entire town was serviced by the Donna Ricker field outside and it wasn't saying much. It was natural grass that was usually a, a big puddle of mud. It didn't have a track, it didn't have lights, it didn't have bathrooms. Um, we had no soccer program uh, our girls' softball program had to use a uh, Pomponio field. We didn't have the 14th Street field. That was still an abandoned factory called Cellafilm. So if you came into Woodridge in 1999 or year 2000, and you thought that you'd wind up where we are today, um, somebody would think you're crazy. Somebody would think you're drunk. Somebody would think you're imagining it. And what allowed us to address some of those deficiencies was going through the redevelopment process at Curtis Wright. It wasn't without risks, it wasn't without challenges. It was certainly scary for a bunch of people who thought that you know everybody's participation was to just take care of the town they love, um, not to become overnight bankers and investors and engineers and architects and planners, but that's what everybody had to do in rolling up their sleeves. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to the mayor about how he formed different stakeholder committees and take us through the goals of the redevelopment process. <clears throat> so before I left, uh, we had three, three investments, right? Education, recreation, and infrastructure. 
after convening meetings with this group of folks, uh, Mayor Council, Board of Education, Planning Board, Recreation Committee, Resident Advisory Committees, from those three investments that we wanted to make, we came up with five major goals for future redevelopment. Our major goals was to create rateables, recover from the Curtis Wright tax appeals, pay off Curtis Wright tax appeal bond, that $8 million that I spoke about, create new housing stock, new housing stock that would not compete with the single family homes on 50 by 100 lots in Woodridge, a different type of housing stock, and invest in Woodridge aging infrastructure and facilities. We had to re remediate, go back one second if you don't mind. We had to remediate, this is something that's lost. The $12 million to remediate that, $12 million all paid by a private developer, and we built a new train station. These were the goals, creatables, remediate the site, and build a new train station. If at least we could get off to the ground on those three, we could get to these two. Goal four was to expand school facilities. Back then, when we were going through this process, it was to build a new middle school. The goal was to keep grades five and six out of the high school, reduce class sizes, and have four classrooms per grade. As you heard from Tony Albro and Chris, the intermediate school kind of fell on our lap a little bit. You're going to hear a little bit more about that. And goal five was to expand recreation facilities. We wanted a home field for Woodridge High School and its recreation soccer program. Soccer was becoming uh, a sport uh, that was just uh, growing exponentially here in Woodridge and, and in New Jersey. Uh, we wanted a home for Woodridge High School, its tra recreation track and field. And we wanted additional fields to increase participation. So the area, for those 145 acres, 85 acres were factories, 60 acres were parking lots, paved parking lots, and storage areas. When I mean storage areas, it was a dumping ground, quite frankly. There were seven acres of a vacant strip mall and a grand Union grocery store. And that's where Butterfields was, for those who went to Butterfields. I was a little too young to get into Butterfields. I did try to sneak in, um, but Butterfields was the place there. Um, um, this area here was a 2 million gallon water tank built underground with trees on top of it to service the factory. And this area here was the landfill where they buried all their garbage and all their industrial waste. And then they kept putting additional materials under the parking lots and they would keep repaving the parking lots to hide it all. That's the dead ends of Marlboro, Winter, Windsor, Ennis, all those dead ends. If you, if you were able to drive right up through the tree line, you would hit their landfill. Um, that was the grocery store? Yeah. And the parking lots were here. And the and the to so the total redevelopment area that we declared was 152 acres. We adopted the redevelopment plan in 2004. <clears throat> By adopting that plan, we doubled the property value from when they purchased at 50 million, we went to 100 million. 1999, remember a judge told us we were worth 19 million. It ignited a chain reaction from 2010 to 2023. Remember 2009, we had the Great Recession. Uh, real estate in North Jersey was really struggling. Over that time, we created new rateables, we produced new revenue, we invested in new infrastructure and services and in, resulted in increased home values. <clears throat> we had an investment in growth, which equals prosperity with no cost to the Woodridge taxpayer. <clears throat> I'm gonna now have Chris walk up, because I know he loves talking about this intermediate school uh, and, and the role he played in it uh, to talk about the, uh, how that came to be. So as the mayor said, when we did the redevelopment plan initially, um, the main concern was a middle school because of the fact that we had crowding in both of our existing buildings and we felt that we had grade levels in this building that were too young. Um, what we could have never dreamed about in 2003, 2004, is that one day our beloved Assumption Parish School will be closed by the Archdiocese of Newark. 
And the way we found out about it was the way that everyone else in town found about it. On the last day of school in June of 2010, um, the kids went home and were told uh, the next day that the parish school wouldn't be reopened that following September. Is that me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stop. Phil's our AV guy from the band days, right? Um, so we had to take action. The building became available. The building became available. Um, the mayor, myself, some of the council members um, had meetings with the archdiocese. We approached the archbishop. We were the first time in the archdiocese history that they sold a school building to a town. Prior to that, they had only leased buildings. So selling us the building was a major accomplishment. Um, we were able to do it because of our partnership with the parish, quite frankly. Everybody who was involved in the mayor and council, the school board, other stakeholder groups were parishioners, and that really went a long way. Um, another major factor, quite frankly, was the developer. The developer, when he heard about this, immediately agreed to pledge the money, and we were able to buy the building for $2.8 million, and we renovated it top to bottom for $8 million, and it gave us capacity for over 300 more students. Um, 12 classrooms of general education, three specialty rooms, cafeteria, a gym, uh, and it also allowed us to realign the whole school district. Uh, we brought uh, fourth, and, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades there, um, taking fourth grade out of Doyle, which helped with some of the Doyle crowding, and we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fourth and fifth grades out of Doyle, rather, and sixth grades out of the high school. At that time, the major, major selling point, and it was a major accomplishment. There's people sitting in this room to include on our governing body who had children in Doyle at that time. Prior to the intermediate school, Doyle had over 30 kids in a class all the time. And in that period of time, Doyle regularly had 500 to 550 students while only being at grades K through five. Doing this building gave us the ability to pledge to parents that the district's new alignment would always have a goal of four classrooms per grade and an average class size of 25 students. Also, it's important to note, as Tony and, and the mayor have alluded to, at that time period that Doyle fell, uh, excuse me, that the intermediate school fell into our lap, we were still dealing with very old buildings, okay? Today, you might think of this as just automatic or things that, you know, how could this be? But the fact is, and it wasn't unique to, to just us, Bergen County, most of New Jersey would have been in this boat. Just 10 short years ago, none of our school buildings had air conditioning. They didn't have security systems. We didn't even have parking lots. Um, the condition of some of our buildings were not the greatest. We had windows in some rooms that wouldn't open or they wouldn't close once you opened them. We had heating systems that were frequently causing us troubles. Remember, we had a, a major issue in this building where we had to do an emergency appropriation to replace a boiler. We also had a portion of our roof fail on this building. So we were throwing a lot of good money after bad. Um, we had science labs that predated anybody who'd be alive now. Uh, and we, at Doyle School, we didn't have a playground. And again, we look at our enrollments. I don't know how they did it back then. Um, Tony could tell us he was there. But how we did over 500 students at Doyle um, and how we did over 600 students in this building, uh, it was a miracle. And it also goes to show the fact that we've come a long way in terms of what is expected in our educational programs, what the state standards are, and what we all want for our kids and what we all know ourselves. Just because we could all say, hey, we did it with 30 kids or 40 kids in a class doesn't mean we want our kids to do that. And that's why we're all here and that's why we keep investing and moving forward with our improving our school facilities. Also, as Mr. Albro said, very, very significantly, what academic programs didn't we have at that time, just 10 short years ago? We did not have an in-house preschool disabled program. We did not have a pre-kindergarten program. Uh, and again, we at that time were operating with just three classrooms per grade and well over 30 students in a classroom, which then brings us back to what did the redevelopment do for Woodridge? And the mayor's gonna give you the quick synopsis of how we've taken the revenue from the redevelopment, as well as the contributions from the developer, 
and we've invested them in the community and invested them in the facilities that we all use. And we have not squandered them on, uh, you know, other towns that have gone through processes like this wake up the next day and their police department doubled or their public works department doubled or everybody got 50% pay raises. We didn't do those things. We kept the money invested in our facilities because we knew if we improved our quality of life for our residents, that eventually would lead to home values increasing. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to move through these quite quickly because we want to get to the final piece, the Doyle plan. Um, Chris talked about the intermediate school following our laps. Here is one of the investments. Uh, another investment, Westmont train station opened 2016. We're getting great ridership, two train stations on both sides of the Woodridge. Uh, all of you know about the Woodridge Athletic Complex opened in 2020, 2021. Borough, had, Borough paid all the costs for this uh, facility and combined with the infrastructure from the developer. One of the premier North Jersey uh, municipal sports complex. We get requests from folks uh, all over New Jersey to come here and play. Uh, Chris touched upon some of the inadequacies in our school districts. So what do we did with the investment? We addressed those inadequacies. High school, 2015, new roof, windows, heating system, new science labs, installed air conditioning and security systems. We built park lots. We renovated the gym. The Woodridge High School field. We did the turf, the track surface. We built concession stand with bathrooms, installed field lighting, and new bleachers. And in 2022, we redid our high school auditorium. <clears throat> in 2015, we moved over to the Doyle School, put a new roof on it with some windows, heating system. We installed air conditioning, security systems. We built some parking lots. And then in 2015, with great support from a lot of different community services, a lot of different community groups, uh, we built a playground. <clears throat> Recreation facilities from the new rateables uh, from 2010 to 2023. Renovated Veterans Park, renovated 13th Street Playground, renovated 6th Street Little League Field, the 14th Street Softball Field we built, uh, which was an old former uh, contaminated site as well. We built the Marshall Lane Playground, and we built the Kennedy Lane Playground and Dog Run in 2022. Infrastructure. This is, I know this doesn't excite a lot of people, but if you're an engineer like me and this is what you do for a living, you get excited when you see stuff like this because people don't realize the, what it means to the values of their homes. Road and sewer program. We paved every road in this community from 2005 to 2020 with rateables. We did a sidewalk replacement a tree planting program. We built the Bianchi House. We renovated the historic Bianchi House. Um, we built the Bianchi House Park. Bianchi House has been here a long time. Uh, we renovated the Civic Center and Senior Center, and we renovated the Firehouse in 2022. So what is left? <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all these bullets because Chris is going to touch upon them as he walks you through the Doyle plan. In my opinion, what is left is we need to address. So we looked at a bunch of sites. Uh, we looked at a bunch of sites when we said, what is left? We looked at sites here on Hackensack Street, two sites on Hackensack Street. We looked at the Rack site. Uh, we looked at a bunch of sites. But each site didn't address those two points. We needed to enhance our educational opportunities and outcomes district-wide. We wanted to ensure we could small, provide smaller classroom sizes. We know that's where everybody's leading to in the educational world these days, smaller classroom size, greater capacity. We wanted to keep more special ed students in district. We wanted to expand our academic offerings, which requires more space and flex space. We wanted to enhance, but at the same time, we recognized that Doyle was limited and we needed to do some work at Doyle. Uh, Doyle had some limitations. It was a 1952 building. Still a great building, by the way. I've been at some school buildings recently that, um, and I've been invited to go down to a, a school in Newark next week for a K through three. Uh, and they're going to tell me I'm going to walk out of there with tears in my eyes after I walk through that. Clearly, we had some limitations in our Doyle school. Um, we, need, we need to do better. So what's left? We're going to expand, enhance our educational opportunity, and we're going to address our facility limitations at Doyle school. I'm going to have asked Chris to come up, and he's going to walk you through the plan uh, that's on the table, the brick and mortar that we are proposing for this community.
Thanks, Mayor. So the goals and objectives have already been alluded to. I don't think I have to repeat those for anybody. Um, plus, we all are very familiar with the building. I just want to say that these plans and these ideas don't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, I don't go to bed and have a dream overnight or the mayor doesn't or members of the council or members of the school board. Um, these are really collaborative. We've had a long period of, of, of investigation between myself, the mayor, members of the school board, members of the council. I talk to Tony Albert almost every day. Um, we've been utilizing the school board architect and the school board engineer um, on these projects. We always do things with professionals who are certified by the Department of Education and expert in their field. So what I want to lay out here is we're going to have better pictures in some of the future slides, but I just want to show you the site plan of where this lays out and just to orient you. Whoops, sorry. This, I don't like this. Let me use my own pointer. Sorry, guys. So that is Woodridge Avenue. That is the front entrance of Doyle. That's 12th Street. That's Highland Avenue. And that's the backyards of the homes that face on 10th Street. Um, the short version of what we want to do is build a wing that will basically be parallel to the 12th Street wing. It basically runs off the back of the, I call it the principal's wing of the building and goes out towards Highland Avenue. I know what everybody's seeing is the impact on the playground. The playground for this process will have to be dismantled and it'll be rebuilt a year later. Um, that is really the biggest sacrifice that we're gonna have during this process. It's just unavoidable. We knew it when we were building the playground that any expansion of Doyle would mean that the playground would have to be temporarily relocated. Um, this plan picks up on a plan that was put forward by the school board back in 2008 and 9. Uh, unfortunately, it was rejected by the voters uh, in a referendum. Um, a lot of us tend to think that that really was less about people's commitment to our schools and more about the fact that just a referendum was coming out. I hear an echo. If I'm killing people's ears, I'm sorry. Um, you really think that the reason why that referendum wasn't embraced at the time is just as it was going to the polls, there was the, uh, the announcement about Doyle, clo excuse me, uh, the Assumption School closing. So I think a lot of people say, well, why are we going to build an addition if we have the Catholic school uh, vacant now? So that plan from back then had a small wing going off the back of the building and then another wing going off the front of the building, off the front of the gymnasium out towards Woodridge Avenue. So the first four plans, anything yellow means it's new construction. Anything blue means it's a renovation. Right now, I just want to focus in on the yellow of what's new. As we said, this wing will come off of an existing exit doorway. That's right off the principal's wing of the building. And it will project out towards Highland Avenue. The main goal, everybody said on the school board side and on the, the academic side, that the goal is to give us a home for our kindergartners where they could all be together, both general education and self-contained special education, and where they could all be on the first floor and where everybody could have a bathroom. So this wing is entirely dedicated to kindergarten. We have eight kindergarten classrooms, all with bathrooms, six for general education, two for self-contained special education. We also have a faculty room and faculty bathrooms. That got a, a standing ovation when we told it to the faculty in a meeting last week because they don't even have bathrooms right now. We have student bathrooms. We also know that one of the major detriments of the building in terms of scheduling and how it functions is that it still relies on a multi-purpose room, which is an outdated idea that was very popular back in the 50s, but it doesn't work today. The idea that you have to have one, that you use one room for all the kids' lunches, for all the kids' gym classes, and for the occasional assembly, means that all you're doing all day long is moving kids in and out. They have to shift to half of the room. The custodians have to put up tables, break down tables, so that by building a gymnasium, we are addressing a major deficiency in the building in terms of how they could schedule the building. This will now give a lot more flexibility in terms of the number of lunch periods. It'll also allow for additional periods of special education, which we don't currently have. Um, there's also a bonus to the town, and which is really a bonus to, to anybody who's a school parent, and that's that our summer recreation program is bursting at the seams. Last summer was the first year ever we exceeded 400 children, and yet we don't really have enough spaces 
indoor spaces to keep them occupied when we have rainy days or when we have those days that's 100 degrees and humid. So building this gymnasium, it's going to be designed with its own lobby and entrance that will, can be sealed off from the rest of the building so that now we'll have a home for our summer recreation program for the younger grades. The older grades will be here at this facility. And it also will give us a home for our boys and girls recreation basketball programs and our recreation cheering programs, which are currently, you know, they're, they're always jockeyed around. And let's be very frank about it. They get the short end of the stick to the high school programs, and understandably so, because the gymnasium here has to be used for the varsity and uh, junior varsity boys and girls basketball programs. Also on the first floor, back to the multi-purpose room, we're going to build a proper kitchen. Right now, the entire lunch program is basically run out of a converted storage closet with all the food being prepared off-site. Building this kitchen will allow us to expand the hot lunch program. I don't know much about it. Um, I, I know how to eat, but I don't know anything that goes into a lunch program. But I'm told by Mr. Albro and those who administer it that this kitchen is going to make a world of difference in the lunch program and, and the kids' reception to the, to the food that they're served. Um, it also is going to go a long way to, again, the idea that this room can now be set up almost exclusively for lunch and we don't have to keep moving kids in and out and moving tables and chairs, and they'll simply be broken down for the occasional school play or, or school assembly. There will be a second floor on the new wing that, again, it's going to exactly mirror the first floor wing. I'm going to blow it up for you. It follows the same roof line as the existing building. So the roof line along Woodridge Avenue, that is a very high peak roof, will blend right into this roof line so that from Woodridge Avenue, you're really not going to notice much of a change or even realize that anything's behind it. This wing on the second floor, which will have two staircases and an elevator, will have 10 classrooms that we envision um, being for third and fourth grade. That'll mean that fourth grade will come back out of the intermediate school, and we're going to talk about that in, in a couple of minutes as to why that's important. But third and fourth grade will be able to guarantee them five home rooms each. Uh, we'll have student bathrooms, faculty bathrooms. We'll also have the headquarters permanent office space for our child study team. And we will also have three areas that, from an architect standpoint, it's just called small group instruction. From the academic programming with Mr. Albro and his team, and when you see the first floor, we have other rooms like that, it'll be up to them to determine how they're programmed. But that runs the gamut of everything from physical and occupational therapy to gifted and talented to special education self-contained to uh, teacher meetings with parents to evaluating pre-K students, so on and so forth. It will give tremendous, tremendous flexibility um, to the building and to all of our academic programs. So let me go to the blue, the renovations. I already alluded to the small group instruction. We're going to take what I call the principal's wing of the building, and there's three classrooms there. They will all be demised. They're, they're each around a little over 1,000 square feet. We'll create six additional small group instruction rooms of over 500 square feet. Combined with the three upstairs, we'll have a total of eight that are dedicated and purposed for what is determined to be necessary academically. Um, our beloved media center that was crown jewel was built 20 years ago will be renovated and restored and the art room that was uh, built at the same time will be renovated and restored so we'll have a dedicated art room dedicated media center and that media will also have some learning spaces in it for whatever academic uh, programs make sense some enrichment programs some special projects that, that children do um, as we move back towards the kindergarten wing um, these two rooms here, I believe they're number 10 and number 11, they were designed to be first, first grade classrooms, but they're currently being used as kindergarten classrooms because of we needed to utilize two of our kindergarten classroom bathrooms in there. And we get away from the county because there's bathrooms in close proximity and a teacher's aide can bring, a paraprofessional can bring the children to the bathroom. We have a happy accident right here. It's funny, I'm talking about bathrooms. I said accident. That was not intentional. Um, this little part of the building is directly over a basement. 
where the boilers are. We're able to build two bathrooms into rooms, uh, I believe it's rooms 10 and, 10 and 11. So these two rooms will gain bathrooms. And then combined with this bathroom, this room that's for self-contained special ed that already has a bathroom, we will have three additional rooms that will be um, set up for self-contained special education uh, at the pre-K level, the preschool disabled program. It then leaves the what was always called the kindergarten rooms and the kindergarten wing. Those four classrooms each have a bathroom. We're going to renovate those bathrooms. We're going to renovate those classrooms, bring them more modern, more up to date in terms of their fixtures and their outfitting. And that will be the pre-K program that could be restored, general education pre-K. So that way we'll have integration between our special ed students or our disabled students and our general education students to have an inclusive pre-K where the whole core cohort of pre-K students can be together all in this wing. Um, one other renovation that I want to point out, it's, it's more of a security issue. The lobby is going to be renovated to create an air dam or a breezeway, whatever you want to refer to it as, that will allow us to have a double locking system. So anybody who's admitted into the building um, will be buzzed in and then still have to make it through a second set of doors. That'll be security doors before they're in the building. And it isolates the staircase and the, uh, that goes down to the multi-purpose room and it isolates the hallway that brings you into the student spaces. Um, you know, I talked earlier about shared services. Uh, the governing body, the mayor and council funds class three special police officers to patrol the schools. We're adding a third officer for this coming September. That'll mean that every school has a dedicated officer. Um, that will help and that will be uh, where the officer admits people. To sum it up, we're gaining 18 classrooms from new construction. Because three are being modified from the existing wing, it's, it's a net gain of 15. We build eight new small group instructional classrooms. We will now have 15 classrooms with bathrooms versus five now. We'll have six classrooms reserved for general education kindergarten and four classrooms reserved for pre-kindergarten. We'll have five classrooms for our self-contained special education programs. And we'll be able to sit to, you know, I should go back. Um, in what was called the fifth grade wing and the, uh, the, the 1994 edition and a part of the old, the original building, these white rooms are 12 classrooms. Those 12 classrooms will be for first and second grade. So we'll have as many as six homerooms available for first grade and second grade. So we're keeping all the age levels in their cohort together. The way the building is designed, we have some happy accidents because we take a whole city block. We have separate entrances that we could stagger how we do our drop-offs and the timing of when they begin. And it, it really does work well. The architects are very pleased with this uh, and, and have a high degree of confidence in how this will, will function. Um, this is just reiterating. Again, we restore the art room. We give you the gym so that the multi-purpose room issues aren't there. You could expand the lunch program. Faculty has space. And throughout the building, we're going to go back and address all technology needs and all security needs. And we'll update any fixtures or any furnishings that are out of date or obsolete. Mayor? Our schedule. Um, schedule's pretty aggressive. Um, but what's making this possible is there's a recent state law that's come out in about the last year or two. It's called the design build process. Um, the mayor could talk more about it. He does it for a living. But the, the beauty part of the design build process is, is that it allows you to start construction as your plans are being designed. Uh, and you design your plans and you, and you move your construction at the pace that's necessary so that under the old way of doing construction, you couldn't dig a foundation until you literally picked out the light fixture that was going in the bathroom. Now you could start with your structural work, your, 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 your outer infrastructure, while you're still designing interior spaces like bathrooms or kitchens. And will dramatically speed and trials. So construction will start this year. 
and it will go all through 2024. The summer of 2024, all the exterior work will have been completed on the building so that we could restore the playground and the play areas outside. We will also use that summer to renovate all the existing bathrooms in the building. And then when the September 24 school year starts, we'll be doing all the interior work on the new wing and bringing in all the new furnishings, all the new fixtures, et cetera. There will be the opportunity with the way we're designing the project that as space becomes available during, during 2024, that we could shift kids in as appropriate. We're not gonna let the rooms stay unused just because we need to wait for a September of 25 school year to begin. The one thing that we will not do, Mr. Albro said it, everybody says it, it's logical, we could all agree, we're not gonna move kids out of, in, of a, in a building or out of a building mid-school year. So that the today's second grade, if you have a second grader, you will be the last group of children who will take fourth grade in the intermediate school. And that will be in the September of 24th school year. If you have a first grader right now in the Doyle School, they will be the first group that stays in the Doyle School an extra year and September of 2025 comes in to everything completed, perfect, brand new, and we'll take fourth grade in the Doyle School. I think that was our last slide. That's the last slide. Go back there. Yeah. One more. Just a couple of missing pieces. I know we're going to have the Board of Ed president, and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is a very aggressive schedule, there's, but there's no reason, in my opinion, we can't build uh, an ex expansion of the school in 18 to 24 months. Uh, and that's what we've built in here. Trust me, we are going to be pushing the design build team, whoever that um, potential uh, contractor uh, architect is, to improve upon this. We'll do some value engineering. Uh, and as, as Chris said, we're never going to move a group of children uh, or in another building, but we're going to start to occupy spaces as they become available. So there is a potential you will see some some in the 2024 uh, piece. You'll be seeing some kid, some students occupying some existing uh, spaces. I want to make it clear. Chris did a great job of laying out the structures, the brick and mortar, and he put some tags on all the buildings, right? And that's important as you're laying out the size of the buildings how we occupy them, how we populate them, and how we teach them is not our job, right? I feel this is our final obligation as a redevelopment agency, is to fund and build this. After we fund and build this, this was the final obligation I feel like I took upon in 1999, 2000, when I declared uh, Curtis Wright and area need a redevelopment. It's gonna be up to Mr. Albro, the Board of Education, and a whole group of very, very talented educators sitting over there and some of them are sitting home and some are watching. That talented group are gonna be responsible to ensure the spaces that we're providing, how to teach them, how to populate them, how to equip them with the technology and the books that they need. Uh, I just want, want to make that clear. That's not our job. Our job, is, and, and through the redevelopment process, uh, with rateables that are coming in, we are going to be able to fund this school uh, and, and build this school uh, with new rateables. I'm going to be very aggressive in my role as a senator. I will be honest with you. Uh, looking for some dollars from the state um, to help us on this because we did, we did undertake a lot. We created a redevelopment. We created added amenities to the state of New Jersey. We built a train station, quite frankly, uh, uh, a municipal-owned train station that we turned to Curtis Wright. Many towns can't say that. So we're going to be looking for some return on our investments and some of the risks that we've taken. With that being said, I think we've covered all the different aspects. Turn it over to our president, Albi Nieves. So because this is not a uh, board meeting, while we stand up and answer your questions, you can just come as long as it's you know orderly. Um, either Tony or someone up here will we'll answer them. A couple of things. So for those of you who are here, fortunate enough to ask questions, great. For those of you online, um, please send either, you know, myself, uh, Tony, or directly to uh, central office, just like we do for board questions. Uh, we'll make sure that we respond to every single one. Um, two important notes. You know, we're fortunate enough to have a mayor and council um, who's going to build an expansion onto Doyle for us. 
um, but they are not responsible also for the operating cost. Um, that means we have to um, have teachers um, into the building. Um, because it's in the same facility, in the same building, um, we can minimize administration, but we still need to put teachers in the building. That means that we're go we are going to come to uh, the public with a question, um, and that question is going to be um, so an increase to our budget. Um, we will you know, learn more about that. I think we're all familiar with that, um, which leads me to my next piece, which is you know, we want to do this right. We want to be collaborative. Um, we want to be transparent. So we are going to be forming a uh, committee of parents um, that are going to help us make decisions about everything that's not brick and mortar. Um, and that would include um, things about the second question, because we do have some folks that are in the room that have experience with that. Um, so we will be reaching out. Um, I would also uh, say if you have any interest in being either online or here, you can talk to one of us tonight. Um, please email central office, um, and as we get closer, we'll be putting that committee together. So uh, that's all I have. I um, want to thank everybody who, who did come tonight, everybody who's watching online. Um, at that point, uh, at this point, I will pause, and I will open it up to anybody who has questions out there. I'm sorry. Uh, state law says when you can have the referendum question, and there's four times that you can. It's either in September, December, January, or March. And they actually, no, they actually specify which day of the month, but they have a long ramp up period. It's like a minimum of six months that has to go in to get it approved. In my mind, and speaking with Mr. Albro, and we spoke to our auditors it seems most likely that we would either be January or March of the 24, which would still give us over a year to, you know, before these, the uh, construction is totally complete, because uh, the main purpose of the referendum will be for, for staffing. So once you know it's approved, then Mr. Albro will have a whole year of advertising positions and going through. And It's, it started, Mr. Caputo, in my office with the child study team, starting to outline. Obviously, if you're if you're talking about filling all of these rooms, that's your that's your first uh, draft, if you will. We're going to have enough students to fill six classrooms. Now let's talk about how many teachers we need in each grade level, and then realizing taking the fourth grade out of the intermediate school and bring it down to Doyle School, more staffing, more staffing for physical education, music, art because those students, those staff members now are going to teach more classes each day and possibly take teachers from the intermediate school in a special area and teach part of their day at Doyle School. Having, for example, the gymnasium, there'll be a divider in the middle. So, you know, you're aware that there's actually a mandated amount of time for phys ed for students, and every school in Bergen County has difficulty meeting that. That's going to enable us to do that. Not having a lunchroom as our physical education classroom, we'll be able to do that. And in addition to, if we're going to expand our self-contained classrooms and offer those services, that can impact our occupational therapy, our speech therapy, our physical therapy, our behaviors. So all of those things fit into the puzzle. Probably at the end of this current budget cycle, because I've got to focus on that right now and get ready for September. And we'll have, we'll have you know, you start. You have to start targeting what kind of teacher you're going to hire, what kind of salary you're going to budget for, paraprofessionals, supplies for the classroom, those types of things.
In the Well, I think based upon the timing that was drawn out in terms of when the question is and, and lining up with our next budget year, yes. Yes. And as you mentioned in the board meeting about capital reserve and money moving over, we kind of know where our needs are being met now. So moving forward, perhaps we can account for that money that we haven't put in capital reserve yet and put it into our budget. We've been saving for a rainy day. Yes, it, depending upon the timing of everything, and in the meantime, before that question even comes to the, to the public, myself, Mrs. Murray, and my administrators have to work within what we have as a budget to meet those needs. We're not going to wait for the building to open to decide if we can outfit this right now in terms of staffing. We're not, we're not going to hire six teachers for four rooms, but in terms of the other services that we now are going to come, if you build it, it will, it will come. We're going to do that. Yes. I, I would say it would come in timing with the release of the budget because the budget, if it contains the trailers as a capital expense, um, the, the projected purchase of the trailers was for a three-year window, not knowing what the construction would be. Um, so I would anticipate to be able to answer that question once our budget is submitted to the county and approved by the board. Obviously, we have a public hearing to discuss the aspects of the budget. So that would be the time to ask the questions about what's different. The thing to remember is, I don't know what COVID gave us positively, but the government gave us a great deal of money over the last couple of years that we've been able to do certain things that we wouldn't have been able to do anymore. Now that money is almost exhausted and we want to keep some of the things that we were able to implement. That's the challenge of the budget moving forward until we get to that point where we can have a question and raise our cap, not only for outfitting the school at the beginning, but keep that going down the road. In answering that question right now, for example, our incoming kindergarten for next year as of yesterday was at 58, which is which is a slower smaller number than the past but we've been surprised in the past and one difference is in past years when we had our gen ed preschool program those kids were rolling into kindergarten we already had them accounted for so right now we have our preschool disabled children rolling over we have new people coming in but i would anticipate i mean historically as the principal i had families with four children go through doyle school and forget to register the last one for kindergarten so those numbers are going to continue to grow you get past 100 you're at five classes you know, it, 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 you're, when you're working in the early elementary, our first grade right now, our second grade right now, very easily, if the space was there, could roll into six classrooms. So without predicting this kindergarten class and the class behind it, I think having down the road a preschool feeding, you're talking about possibly 16 students in a class, 64 students, you already know who your kindergarten is and you have a better judge of what the numbers are going to be. Based upon the, everything I've read, we wouldn't plan it otherwise. But at some point in the mid-80s, they thought four rooms was enough space. So this, this, is, this far outweighs any previous move. And I am hopeful. 
I'm not a statistician, but I'm hopeful this will meet all of our needs. Yes. The, the, one, the one thing right now in the high school, from a space perspective, we're not having an issue with our space in the high school. When you consider that when this plan is completed and fourth grade comes out of the intermediate school, there'll be only two grades in the intermediate school, grades five and six, in preparation for the larger section groups that are coming up eventually from the Doyle School. The intermediate school has 12 full-size classrooms, right now serving three grade levels. Cutting it down to two grade levels at some point now gives you more space to accommodate the growing population. But the high school right now, we're in a pretty good place in terms of our class size, in terms of our use of facilities. No, I just want to answer. So I actually think if you look at the peaks and valleys of the different class sizes, including my own daughter in seventh grade, 71 kids, I actually think there will be a point in time across you know, the next 10 years, we'll actually wind up either, either having empty classrooms or we'll have to significantly drop that number, especially if we're, if we're staffing it. So I do back it up. And I do think that, you know, it'll it'll fluctuate. I am, <clears throat> I am looking at, but he's looking at total number across the entire district. Um, and I do think that there'll be, there's only so many houses that you could actually. The last building is accounted for. Um, one thing in the study that I think is very important. Yes, the one on Passaic Street. Yeah. 290. Yeah. I think one important thing that should just be pointed out about that study. Um, when it was done, we met with the professor who ran the study. And there's two different models that are used to project enrollments. And there's the one that's based on birth rates. And there's another, the other one is based on the housing turnover. Um, two things that are very significant about those two formulas is that the birth rate model, he even admitted, doesn't work in our school district because of the fact that we had the redevelopment and that you had like 300 childbearing age families move in within like a two or three year period all at once. So he excluded that from the data. Had he not excluded it from the data, it would have said that our school district would turn into 1,500 students, which nobody believes, because we're at 12, like 1230 or 1240 right now. And we've never gone higher than 1250. And over the last 10 years, we've, we've sort of whipsawed between 1150 to 1250. And then on the housing turnover, where I think there, there is a bit of a flaw in it, he didn't control for the Westmont development in the housing turnover formula. The housing turnover formula, again, you had all those townhomes get built and get sold. That puts them through the formula of housing turnover. But if you use the housing turnover formula, his projection for the school district is around 1,250 students, which is exactly where we are now. Um, so we're, we're very, very confident based on, on his study and knowing that we're at the end of the Westmont Station redevelopment uh, in terms of producing new, new housing that will meet our needs. I, I just want to add one thing. Um, I've seen a lot of demographic studies over the years. Uh, Jerry, you've seen a lot of demographic studies, right? Okay. You pay a lot of money for these demographic studies, right? There's not one person in this room who's an expert on demographic studies. None of us are experts on demographic studies. The individual who wrote this claims to be an expert in demographic study. I will tell you my gut feeling as somebody 
who, who has been part of this every step of the way. Um, Chris touched upon it. We had, at the same time, young families moving in. All at one time, just as we were coming into the pandemic and out of the pandemic, we also had a large turnover. Our senior citizen clubs, our senior citizen clubs, we went from three down to one. What's our total numbers of senior citizens reduced now? It's two clubs. We're down to two clubs. We had three with big numbers. What I'm getting, our housing stock has turned over. We can look at our building permits, the houses that were renovated after the pandemic from folks who moved from New York City, higher income folks who decided to move here and renovate some of those older homes. You had the perfect storm. It's never going to happen again. I'm, I'm comfortable saying it. Maybe they can't, but I can say it. I'm comfortable saying that that was a perfect storm. And as for the high school, great question. Been here a long time. What's going on in the high school world out there, not just Woodridge, but across the state of New Jersey, there's a lot of opportunities when kids get to high school. A lot of things come into factors. There's the parochials, right, that people want to explore the parochials. There's the academies um, that are never going away. The academies, uh, the, every county now is continuing to build academies. And then there's the sports-minded folks, right? We all, know, we all lived in that world where folks want to go out uh, for the opportunity for their child to play in a, in a program, get a good education, but play for a, an opportunity for sports. I believe our high school, um, we are going to be fine because there's so many opportunities for students. Um, and what we're seeing at Westmont, we're seeing a lot of young families who are moving in. Um, a lot of them have a lot of, uh, in the tech sector, a lot of folks in the, in the tech sector, in the high tech sector. Uh, I don't wanna use the word transient, but a lot of them have the opportunity to move and move quickly um, to other parts of the country and are willing to do that as part of their jobs and their careers. Um, we could sit here all night and talk about enrollment and demographic studies, and we could all agree or disagree what's on that paper. Um, I'm pretty comfortable sitting here today that this is going to be more than enough capacity for our school district. That would be a problem, and that's why we do it um, as early as we do. <laughs> so it would have to, so we, so that would be, okay. So this is going to have a cost to it. Let's just say $25 million. Um, that's coming from mayor and council. They're allowed to give us, you know, a, a one-time bill. For operating costs, everything from electrical to staffing is an expense that the board is required to pay for it becomes you know, part of our operating um, income and cost. So in order to staff that building with teachers, we are going to have to go out to the public. So what Tony is saying is he's got to figure out towards the end of you know, this budget season, you know, what is it going to take to staff those rooms? So he'll know, um, he'll have to make some assumptions uh, with the administration based on how we're going to staff that because there's multiple levels, there's different certifications, et cetera, what that budget's going to be. Then. Okay, once we go through one more budget season, which going into 2024, is there specific times that the state requires us, or the DOE would require us to actually ask that question, and then we would come to the public. And that's what we're going to be asking our parent committee and everyone to be part of. Well, no, you would have multiple, it would be actually almost like two years. So it would be more than once if we had to go to the public to ask. It could be. It is a risk. When we did the intermediate school, we had the same design scenario, and it passed with 75% support to, to hire the faculty for the intermediate school. Great. Uh, give him a shot, Jerry. Yes. So we're not assuming 
you're, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. You're right. Right. So everything you've said, spot on, right? And that's the whole point of having a parent committee is to push the message and couldn't agree with you more about whether you have children or not. It's for the benefit of the entire community. Yes, I, yeah, all fairness people online, I want to make sure we use the microphone. I, I, one of the slides that touched upon that, we contemplated single family homes. Um, we looked at single family homes. Uh, we also looked at the, the amount of dollars it was going to cost to clean up the site. If you factored in all the infrastructure needed and all the cost to clean up the site, um, there would not not be enough single probably family homes to cover those costs. So we decided to go with a little bit of a different type of housing, but we also did that strategically. We didn't want the housing. We wanted a different type of housing. We wanted to give people the opportunity who wanted to move to Woodridge to have the traditional single family homes that I grew up in and continue to live in. And I enjoy that's my living. Um, some people love the townhome type of, of setting. Everybody is different. So we, we didn't want the, we wanted strategically when we realized, a, you know, sprawling, Suburban sprawl single family homes may not work there. It worked out to our advantage because we're not competing for values against each other. We're adding values, we're complementing each other. Right. Right. We had a public input, it was a charrette process where there was a lot of input from residents who said we should look to, to diversify our housing stock. I'll take that. Um, there's never going to be any health problems for any of the children. There'll never be any health considerations at all. Will there be some inconveniences like noise? Yes, there will be some noise. Only for those first putting in the concrete foundations, putting up the steel, putting up the brick and getting the roof on. Once we're inside the building, all that goes away. Um, it's no different if you're going to renovate, renovate your bathroom and your family's living there. Does create a little unfortunate dust and some noise and inconvenience. There will be some inconvenience for that one school year, um, but at any at, what, at any point in time, no child will ever be in harm's way um, or have uh, any health uh, issues or considerations because of the construction. Great, great, great. If we can put the slide, the site plan up real quick. That's a great question. Um, so when you build schools these days on active school sites, um, there is a, so there's a general, um, I, I, ideally, if you live on Woodridge Avenue or uh, 12th Street, you're not gonna be impacted by construction. Uh, if you live on 10th Street, you're really not gonna be impacted by construction. Highland Avenue, right there, we're gonna create that construction entrance right there. And at that entrance, that'll be all fenced in. There'll be a security. The contractor will be required to have a check-in point, a sign-in 
Um, they'll have their own bathrooms, their own office trailer. Nobody will be allowed in the building. Um, anybody who does go into the building uh, will need to, ha it will be after school or during the summer. Uh, it'll be a secure work zone. <laughs> they do this all the time. Uh, and the contractors that will be bidding on this will be all contractors who have built schools on active school construction sites. Um, and the nice thing about Highland is we're able to, to go down, up and over, and down use some of New Jersey transit property for staging areas to limit the amount of disturbance uh, near the property. No summer programs this year there. No. no. There'll be no summer programs at Doyle this year. No outdoor recreation. I, I'm not sure about your in about extended school. <laughs> Once the construction plan is is shared with me in terms of the timeline. I wouldn't, Mr. Sarlo, you can tell me better. I wouldn't, our extended school, our extended school year roughly runs the month of July. And it's, it's could use eight to nine to 10 classrooms in the front of the building or any place else. Would you, would you anticipate that being an issue? From an interior perspective. Summer Rec has moved between the different school buildings traditionally. So clearly for the summer of 24, we can't have Summer Rec here. So that one summer we'll have to just make do between here and the, we don't use the intermediate school anymore for Summer Rec. So probably in 24, we'll have to use the intermediate school for Summer Rec. We may have to just set it up with more class trips and more uh, sort of outside ventures. But again, it's gonna be the year of construction. We're all gonna have to make accommodations, but um, once it's done, We'll, we'll really, really have a, a, a fantastic facility. Ideally, that, ideally that's what would you would want. Um, ideally, I agree. Um, but the, the problem is, can we fully get our bids back, go through the DOE approval and get a shovel in the ground by June of this year? It's going to be quite tight. I don't know if that's really going to happen. And if we go that route, that means we're going to sit all of 24 and we're going to kick our project out another year because we'd have to wait to the following year. So we could still use it for outfitting and other things that are part that are in the school that are non-construction, non-capital. So, so desks, other things that are going to go into that room. So we'll, we will be using, I believe, part of the 1.4 million that's there for outfitting the classrooms. Right. So it's not that we're not going to use that. Yeah, the 3.3. Right. So there was there was so the three point three million. 
So the maintenance, the maintenance we will have to use as part of as part of the, the building. The 1.4 we can outfit, so that is going to take care of that from the 4.5. The 3.3, right? That's going to be used for capital projects. Don't know where we're going to to use that, how we're going to disperse that yet. However, the money that the money that we typically save each year to put into capital reserve, like we would for this budget or next year's budget, we're not going to move that because we want to pull that back. So it'll lessen the burden on the public so that we can actually hire or put that aside for the hiring of teachers. I'm sure, I mean, Tony's nodding his head. So you want to answer? I'm nodding in a hopeful way. Yeah. <laughs> so right now there is, there is no, there is no, um, wiggle room or I, the only, I, what I can't commit to, right. So what I, a little close, right? So what I could commit to you, Jerry, is we don't know, right? There's, there's little wiggle room. We can take it back to Dan and see what we can do. I don't believe that we can, but I mean, you're asking a valid question, a good question, and we'll look into it. Yeah, Jim. That can accumulate. So it has been accumulating time. If I go back 10 years ago, it was like 1.2. So every year as part of our budget process, we put that in. So our long range plan was always to open up another school, whether we had to buy it, 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 you know, buy a building, et cetera. You know, like Paul had said, we've been fortunate enough that we're getting that now, right? And it's not coming out of the school budget. So all that money that we put to the side is sitting there in what we call capital reserve. Capital reserve has got to be for capital projects. We can't pull it out for any other reason. So we actually have a, a good problem, right? Um, instead of now contributing back into capital reserve, what we want to do is actually take the money that we would have budgeted for this year, next year, and take that out and start putting that to the side for the hiring of teachers when the school, so that lessens the burden on the taxpayer. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Correct. So we would never deplete that because it just would be fiscally irresponsible of us as a board. All right. So any you know, final questions or additional questions you may have, filter them in. While we're departing, I will stay here in case anybody wants to come up and, and have a, a couple of, go ahead, Faith, you have one more question? Yeah. 